Let's pray as we come to look at God's word. Lord, we thank you that your word is a light to our feet and a lamp to our path. And so, Lord, we ask that as we come to look at your word this morning, you might shine your light ahead of us, that we would know the steps that you're calling us to take. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So the first verse of our psalm this morning. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. It's there on the screen in front of you. In some translations, I love this. It says, O Lord, our governor, how glorious is your name in all the world. Um, have we, I always kind of think of this, and this might be slightly disparaging, so I'm really sorry, but I always think about this as the psalm for Cockneys. So I don't know if we've got any, any, East, um, any people from East London in the house today. No, any Cockneys, any Londoners? I won't do the accent. O oh Lord, our governor, how glorious is your name in all the world. And I could spend the rest of the day just talking about this verse. But the first thing that I want to draw out from verse 1 is this. It is that God is personal and global. God is personal and global. One of the major themes of the Old Testament, so if you read the first 39 books of the Bible, the kind of the story of the people of God before the incarnation, before the birth of Jesus, one of the major themes is the revelation, the discovery that the God of the Hebrews or the God of the Israelites is the God of the whole earth. Like that might be something that we take for granted now, but for the people of God discovering who this God was that had called them into relationship with him, this was a major discovery. And they had to, as often we humans do, they had to discover it over and over again. So that's why it's a recurring theme. We see it as God is shown to be the true God over the false gods of the Egyptians as they're delivered from slavery. We see it as the people of God are exiled to various powers, but then God rescues them and says, actually, I'm not just the God of this small geographical area, but I'm the God of the whole earth because I can act to rescue my people even when they've traveled beyond the borders of the land that has been given to them. We see this, don't we, that God is a global God in God's call to Abraham, God says to Abraham, through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Who is God to proclaim that unless he's the God of the whole earth? Which, of course, he is. That call to Abraham is then mirrored as Jesus sends his followers, his disciples, and sends you and me to the ends of the earth to call others into relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Why to the ends of the earth? Well, because God is the God of the whole earth. He is a global God. But as well as being a global God, He is a personal God. It astounds me how many people have kind of been to churches all their life and they've never heard an invitation to know Jesus as a personal saviour. And so I want to encourage you, maybe, um, maybe this is your first time here at St. John's Chatham, or maybe we haven't been saying it enough, but I want to encourage you this morning that if you've never considered responding to Jesus as your personal saviour, then maybe today could be the day for you. We are invited, you are invited, I am invited into a personal relationship with the maker of heaven and earth, with the creator and sustainer of the universe. We're invited to know him closely through Jesus Christ, not because of anything that we've done, but because what has been done for us on the cross. And the Bible tells us that it's the whole of the Trinity, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is involved in this relationship because it's the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us if we're followers of Jesus, if we're believers in Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit that gives us the confidence in our relationship with God the Father to call him Abba, to call him Papa, a personal relationship. 
God is both global and personal. Often when we hear the word personal in our very individualistic society, we start thinking about personalized. We start thinking about bespoke. And we start thinking, this is something that's custom made for me. This is something that I can have exactly the way that I like it. You know, you can get your personalized number plate, or you can get your bespoke chair that fits with the curve of your back, or your bespoke pillow, or your custom-made shoes that are exactly your size, or, or, whatever, or whatever it might be. People think, actually, personalized means that I can have a bespoke God who likes the things that I like, and who dislikes the things and the people that I dislike. That's what our individualistic society tells us. But I want to tell you that that's not true. One of the reasons why we shared in the words of the creed and why we try and do that as often as we can is because it reminds us that we don't get to pick and choose who God is. Just because it's a personal relationship with God doesn't mean that we can make him a personalized God. Very God. God. The God who we are invited into personal relationship with is the God whose name, as the psalm tells us, is majestic in the whole earth, and the God whose glory is set in the heavens. Um, I was thinking about what kind of illustrates this, and this is a really um, ridiculous illustration, but I was, um, I was flicking through Instagram the other day, and I saw um, that David Beckham, anyone heard of David Beckham? Yeah, some people have heard of David Beckham. I know that some of you have his poster in your houses, and we'll talk about idolatry later. But anyway, um, so David Beckham took his daughter, Harper Seven, great name. Um, if you're thinking about names for children, stick a number in there. But so, um, so he took his daughter, Harper Seven, to go and see The Weeknd. Um, the Weeknd is, a, 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 I guess, a, a singer. I was going to say a band, but a singer. So anyone heard of The Weeknd? He's got cool hair, kind of like this, but much better. Um, and... And so they were, um, and, and basically David, can I call him David? Let's try it. Um, if he gets in touch, I'll apologize. Um, but so David um, took his daughter and he was just posting a video on his Instagram of how he'd embarrassed Harper because he was singing all of the words out of time. Did anyone else see that? Anyone else follow David Beckham on Instagram? It's just me. Okay, that's fine. Well, this is then going to ruin the illustration because what I was going to say is that David Beckham is, is a worldwide star. Look, Ross is in a Man United shirt. There was, a, there was a time. You're very brave to wear that today. That's all I can say. Very brave. I'm sitting right at the bottom of the table. But anyway, sorry. Um, but, um, but there was a time when David Beckham would have worn a shirt like that and he could actually um, do some great things. He is a world-renowned star. But yet sitting in that concert with his daughter, he is her father. Their father and daughter hanging out, enjoying an experience. It doesn't change who he is. He's still world-renowned, but he's personal to her. They have a personal relationship, and they are able to share the intimacy of such a moment. And multiply that a million times over, and we have a picture of what this psalm is telling us about God. That God is global he is renowned not just on earth, but in the heavens. He set his glory high above everything else. But yet, he is our Lord. He is our governor. I really like that translation, governor, not just because it reminds me of East London, which I love, but also because the word governor reminds us. That means boss, doesn't it? We can sometimes get lost in the churchiness of the word Lord. But the word governor, he is our boss. I don't know how you're living in your relationship with Jesus Christ, but the way that it works best is when we invite him to be the governor of our lives, to be the one who's in control of our lives, not just someone who we invite in at times that suit us, but the one who gets to make the ultimate cause of how we spend our time, how we spend our money, who we grow in friendship with and relationship with, what we do when we're in the unseen as well as we're, when we're in the scene. O oh Lord, our governor, how glorious is your name in all the world. Verse 2 carries on, and we're not going to look at all the verses in this much detail, um, I promise. But verse 2 carries on, through the praise of children. Maybe we could put verse 2 up. Perfect. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. 
That's a lot of words, so I'm going to read it again. By Avenger, this isn't Marvel, by the way. Um, but um, I'm going to read it again, and let's just try and let these words sink in. Through the praise of children and infants, you've established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the Avenger. So the first thing that I want us to take away is that God is personal and global. The second thing that I want us to take away is that God takes the insignificant and makes it powerful. I don't know if anyone ever heard this when they were growing up. Children should be seen and not heard. Did, was anyone told that? Especially when you had guests coming around for dinner. My parents used to remind, remind me, look, you know, we've, we've got the Joneses coming over and, you know, their kids are really well behaved. So Luke, just reminding you that children should be seen and not heard. Clearly now I'm making up for lost time. But anyway, um, you know, the, the challenge is, and the sad thing is that over history throughout the years, the voice of children has been stifled has been silenced. We've told that to children, haven't we? Just smile sweetly and be quiet, and we'll see if we can get to the end of church. Um, that's, we don't tell our children that. No, no, we don't. Um, but, but here, God says something very different. God says, or the, the psalmist says, inspired by the Holy Spirit, so God is saying that actually through children and infants' praise, God is building a fortress God is building something strong. So God is taking something that the world sees as insignificant and something that the world tries to silence or ignore because it can be inconvenient, sometimes uncomfortable, and he is making something powerful with it. I think that's amazing. There is power in the praise that we offer. You know, we were singing to God earlier. We were even waving our hands in the air and jumping. And there's power when we do that. There's power when we declare the truth of who God is. But I think there's even more power when our children and our young people declare that praise. Maybe there's a childlike faith. Maybe there's almost a naive trust that invites God to come and work and move in power among us. So that's what we take away from this verse that there's power in the praise that's offered by children and infants. But I think we also see a more general principle about the kingdom of God. There's so much praise being offered at the back right now. Thank you, Lord. There's power not just in the praise of children and infants, but we see that God takes something small and insignificant and he makes it powerful. We see this in the group of disciples that Jesus calls. We see this in David who becomes king, the shepherd boy who's overlooked behind his brothers when Israel is looking for a new king. We see that in the story of Ruth that we've just been looking at as a church family. And we see that in the church. Big and strong is often not best to God. So embrace weakness. Embrace vulnerability. Because that is how we show God's strength. God takes the insignificant and makes it powerful. The psalmist continues, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You've made them little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You've made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds, the animals of the wild, the birds of the sea and the fish, the birds of the sky, in, in fact, and the fish of the sea, all that swims in the paths of the sea. And then he concludes, because he can't help himself, by repeating that first verse again. So the final thing that I want us to think about in looking at Psalm 8 is that human status is a gift of God's grace. Human status is a gift of God's grace. The psalmist is saying this, and hopefully he won't mind me paraphrasing, paraphrasing God, when I think of all that you've done and all that you've made, it's ridiculous that you would even give human beings a second thought. God, when I think of all that you've done and all that you've made, it's ridiculous that you would give human beings a second thought. 
uh, wonder for a second, and I might need some help with this. Can someone think about the, um, the most incredible kind of animal or creature that you can think of in, in the world? What's the kind of the most impressive? The peacock. Yeah, yeah, peacock. Yeah, nice. You didn't hear the question. I'm so sorry. Do you want me to start the whole thing again? Okay, just the question. Okay, great. Um, what's the most impressive creature in God's creation that you can think about? Yeah, Reggie? You. That's a great answer. Round of applause for Reggie. Come on, I love that. I love that. Any other thoughts? Parrot, I heard. Yes, like a nice macaw. A dinosaur, nice. A moose, like with the big horns. Fish. Um, nice. What do you call a fish with no eye? Fish. Anyway, sorry. Um, no, the, we're, we're getting sidetracked. Um, anyway, um, any, any more? Any more for any more? Like a hand at the back, Cripper. Sorry? A pigeon. Oh, wow. In that case, you would love it around here because there are plenty of pigeons and they like to let us know that they've been visiting. Um, so, uh, Anne-Marie. A butterfly, absolutely. No? A snake? Yeah, great. So, so there, are lots, there are lots of different impressive things that God has created. I tend to, having just said that, you know, big isn't always best, I tend to think about the impressive things like a sort of an elephant or, a, you know, a giraffe or something like that. But, but at the pinnacle of God's creation, the creation that he chooses to place his own image in, God says, let us make humankind in our own image. It's not anything that we've done, but it's a gift of God's grace. Verse 5 is an interesting verse in this psalm. The psalmist says, and I think the version that we looked at says, you made them a little lower than the angels. And um, I don't know, that might sound a little bit weird to you. You can think, oh, well, you know, we're pretty close, but, um, you know, kind of, um, we're sort of peeped in the pecking order by, by some angels. First of all, I'd say, you know, actually, that's quite a great comparison because every time you see angels in the Bible, there's something pretty impressive and something pretty awesome about them. It seems that every time the angels appear, the first thing they need to say to the people that they've appeared to is, do not fear. Do not be afraid. You know, if you think about Mary and the announcement to Mary, there's a, we've got a picture of it there. Mary being told that she's going to give birth to Jesus. The first thing that the angel has to say is, don't fear. I bring tidings of great joy. Um, and time and time again, we're getting very Christmassy, but the angels appearing to the shepherds. Again, they say, don't be afraid. And that's because angels, the messengers of God, these heavenly beings carry something of the awe and the wonder of the heavens and the glory of God. But secondly, I'm also not that convinced that it's a, a wonderful translation because um, something like the message says this, we narrowly missed being gods. I think the word that's translated angels kind of means divine beings really, which could be translated gods. So it's basically saying actually out of all of the things that God has created, the closest thing that he's made to himself is you. Reggie, as you've reminded us of. It's not the snakes, it's not the parrots, it's not the butterflies, it's not the giraffes or the elephants, it's you and it's me. We carry the image of God. As the psalm says, we are crowned with glory and honor. I don't know if you feel crowned with glory and honor this morning. If you don't, I want to encourage you to press in to the truth of what this psalm says about you. You are crowned with glory and honor as you approach God humbly, as you recognize that our status is a gift of grace. Receiving this affirmation, this encouragement of who we are requires that we humble ourselves just like the psalmist does. What is mankind? that you are mindful of us. And on from there, the psalm then talks about recognizing this wonderful gift of grace. Our response to that is to steward the things that God has trusted to us well. To look after the things that God has trusted to us well. You can't read this psalm without thinking about our call to look after the environment. But it's more than that. It's to look after each other. God has entrusted us with one another. God has entrusted us with this place and this time. As we respond to God 
our sovereign God, the God of the world, but yet our Lord. We're called to humbly steward the things that he has given us. God is a personal God and a global God. God takes the insignificant and makes it powerful. Our human status is a gift of God's grace.